Welcome to The Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture. Brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. Hello, my name is Bill Hendricks. I'm the Executive Director for Christian Leadership at the Hendricks Center. And welcome to The Table Podcast, where we consider issues of God and culture. And today, it's my very, very high privilege to welcome Horst Schultz to the Table Podcast. Horst is one of the co-founders of the Ritz-Carlton Hotel brand and uh, has recently put a lot of the things that he learned in that process and really through his whole career in a book, Excellence Wins, A No-Nonsense Guide to Becoming the Best in a World of Compromise. This has his story in it, and laced all through his story is ways in which God has brought him insight into not only business but into people, into how life works, and ultimately into what ultimately really matters. And uh, Horst, just thank you so much for being with us today. Great to be with you. Thank you. So this really all goes all the way back to your your childhood, and you somehow came, got the notion you wanted to be in the, the hotel business. So you That's grew right. up in Germany That's right. in a small town. And as I understand it, uh, that wasn't a very honorable uh, occupation, right? <laughs> no, it was not. And in fact, people laughed at me and, and that I was doing it. And, and the parents of the kids that I was in class with that heard that I said it, they took it home. The parents went to my parents, you know, but you said something terrible. <laughs> it's, it's <laughs> What's crazy. wrong with your son? What's wrong with him? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but you persisted. <clears throat> and uh, to their credit, I guess your folks finally relented and uh, actually found out a path, but that meant eventually you went and worked at a hotel, right? That's correct. I left, I left my village and left my home when I was 14 and, and uh, lived in the hotel in a dorm room in the in the hotel where I worked, which unfortunately was at that at time very far away. It was 100 kilometers. Today that is a sip over the autobahn. At the time it took a long time to get there. But it could have so been 1,000 miles away. That, that's correct, yeah. But you describe with great uh, – I thought it was very, very eloquent in your book – this uh, fellow who was the mater d' there, Carl Zeitler. Sounds like, that's correct, yes, that's his name. And he made quite an impression on you. Why? He made a deep impression. I mean, in fact, for my life, he changed my life. The first day of work with Carl, and I, I mind you, when I was, everybody was laughing, but on the end, my parents said, now you're going to work now in a hotel where we could never go. This is only for very fine ladies and gentlemen. Hmm. I was kind of set up about that. I knew that everybody there was important. I was not. I was told that you are not, you're just a servant, and they are very important. Hmm. But Carl Sertler welcomed me at the first end, two other kids to start at the same time, and said, now, tomorrow you come to work at 7 o'clock here. We show you your work. You clean first, you clean the restaurant, you be sure it's set. You, after, the, after the meal service, you wash the dishes, and it was all clear. And, 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 and the only work that you can do in the rest while the guest is there, clean the ashtrays. And then he said, now, but don't come to work here. Come, come here tomorrow morning to create excellence in what you're doing. Hmm. And I went totally over my head, cleaning ashtrays, cleaning floor, washing dishes. What's so excellence about right, that? Right. But he persisted. He totally persisted and, and keep on saying excellence in what you do. And I slowly, over a couple of years, started to understand what he meant. Hmm. He simply meant don't just do it. Do it with excellence in mind. Not spend more time here, but why create mediocrity if you can create excellence no matter what you're doing? In fact, if you do it excellently, you define yourself as a person of excellence. Right, right. And, and he defined himself as, you. everybody admired him. Every guest, every employee, he was admired, respected, highly respected. That, Mind you, when I say everybody loved him and everyone admired him, he didn't compromise. He didn't compromise with us as employees. He compromised only no, only this high standard. He was a standard setter. And he wouldn't have let anything go by that didn't create great standards. Huge impact on me. Well, you said you began to define yourself uh, by excellence. You said I defined myself. I could be a gentleman. Yeah. Well, in, in fact, I had to write an essay for hotel school, the, 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 the typical way is you go to hotel school once a week, and they ask me 
when I was 16, two years in the business, what do you feel now about the hotel business? And and, and happened that evening when I saw Carl Seidler, the Melody. By the way, he would have never come in the restaurant unless he looked absolutely perfect. Right. Uh, immaculate. He he was excellence. But he approached the table and I realized, it, I, I saw it clearly, I kind of saw it before, but I never realized it. The guests were proud that he came to the table. Mm. And I realized every guest thinks he's the most important person in the room. So did we, the employees. And wait a minute, this is a reversal. We are supposed to be the servants and they are supposed to be the ladies and gentlemen. And uh, when I thought about an SA I was supposed to write, I thought I'd write about him. And I called that SA, I gave it a name and I called it, We Are Ladies and Gentlemen, Serving Ladies and Gentlemen, which eventually I met the, the motto of Ritz Carlton that yeah. became world famous in, right. in our business. Right. But I, I saw that then, so I wrote that essay and I said, and I realized I can either define myself as a gentleman in my work, no matter what that work is. Yeah, not the nature of the work. Not the nature of the work. The way I do it the defines do it. me. Right. The, and Or I can define myself as mediocrity or nothing. So it's up to me. It's not up to society or the world or the next thing. It's up to me how I'm respected or if I'm a lady or a gentleman. Mind you, having been laughed at in school where I came from that I went into this business, that was a discovery for me mm -hmm. to show no matter what I'm doing, I show you all I can be a real gentleman if I do what I do right. And, but, and, and I realized also, and my, the meditator told me always, if you do things right, the rewards will come sooner or later. All right. That's fantastic, because you're getting at something deeper than just whatever the nature of the job is. You're getting at the dignity of the person. That's right. That not only the people being served, but the person doing the serving also has dignity. Yes. Yeah. Well, it's all of a sudden, your work is not just a function anymore. It's a purpose. It's a purpose. Exactly. It has and meaning. we all need the meaning. Well, meaning For me, the meaning all of a sudden was... I'm creating excellence, and I'm creating respect for my excellence and others. I'm going to be recognized. I'm doing the right thing. I can, I can be proud of myself, what I'm doing. I'm not just doing something. I'm not just fulfilling just a function. Mm -hmm. You have stated that excellence is a decision. Tell me mm -hmm. more about that. Well, I'm... I feel very strong about that. Yeah. That in fact everything in life is a decision. Soon we have to make a decision. You now we do it sometimes automatically without knowing that we make a decision. But if you could turn left, you made a decision to turn left. Yeah, right. But how about analyzing that a little bit for your life and be, become more conscious of your decisions? Mm -hmm. I, I, everything, even if you believe in God or not. And I have, to, I have a discussion with a, with a friend of mine who is a proud atheist, by the way. And, and he, he said to me on one of occasion, well, Horst, you don't know. You can't prove that there is God. <laughs> I said, but can you prove that there isn't? Mm -hmm. With other words, you made the decision somewhere. Either that evolved or you came in at one moment decision making. Now, as far as I'm concerned, I made a decision for God. And, and at the same time for hope. Mm -hmm. for knowledge. Now, the longer I made a decision, the more I know I made the right one. Mm -hmm. In fact, you're still questioning yourself. You, you guess what he said. I'm not, not kidding. This was a minute conversation. And he said, well, actually, I'm agnostic. <laughs> 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 Talk one minute. <laughs> well, he's moving. <laughs> uh, he's moving. He's moving. <laughs> but that's a decision I always, <laughs> always say in, in, in speeches and so on, because I want to hit it clear that everything is decision. I always tell everybody, wait, wait a minute, I'm, man, I'm married for over 41 years. I made a decision early on in my life that I would always be in love with my wife, not just love her, mm. be in love. And yet I have friends who said, we're getting divorced. I said, why are you getting divorced? We don't feel like it. Wait a minute, who is in charge here? Mm. Who Are you in charge? Or is the feeling that somehow comes into the room in charge of what you do. I made a decision very clearly. I will honor and love my wife for the rest of my life. Period. So, so with other words, everything is a decision. Hmm. So you make a decision to be excellent in your life and what you do. 
The thing that strikes me so much about your story, Horst, is <clears throat> you've been living with intentionality, hmm. not just randomly, passively, whatever comes along. Yeah. You're like a victim. It's like yeah. you've you've made choices uh, and tried to make them to get you toward your purpose, not without a purpose. Correct. And in fact, I, I, I don't think, look, the Bible says people will perish without purpose. Right. And so, so you have to have a purpose. So what is your purpose? You have to question, you have to question that. You have to be deliberate about it. And you have to implement the things that gets you to your purpose. Mm-hmm. If you're a leader of people, there is no greater gift than you can give them at work than making them part of a great purpose. I always, always said, don't hire employees to work for us. Hire employees to join us. Mm. Show them our purpose. Show them that our purpose is of value to them. Uh, th- this is essential. Why? I think it's nearly immoral how we hire and lead people. Uh, we hire people to f- fulfill a certain function. Well, the chairs on which we are sitting is fulfilling a function. And we're hiring human beings. Mm. The difference is they have thought, they have minds, they have, they have creation of God. Right. And the Bible says purpose is important. If that is true, and they're our neighbors whom we love like ourselves, wouldn't we give them purpose? Absolutely. Oh, yeah, obviously. It goes back <coughs> just to what you said earlier. Carl Zeitler told you, come here to be excellent, have a purpose. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I had doing. a purpose right there. That's right. And and it played a role with me uh, all my life. It, yeah. uh, play, and, and, and it was fulfilling. So unpack that a little bit more, because I think I heard you essentially say that uh, the leader's role is to give people purpose, not just a job to work. Yeah, but uh, the purpose is if, if, if I'm, hiring, I'm hiring you to join me, mm. I have to show you what, who we are as a company, what we think as a company, and where we lead as a company. Where as a going. leader means I'm a head of a group of people leading them to a certain destination. Right. And that destination, if one, once as a leader you establish that destination, in our case, Ritz-Carlton, it was very simply, we will be the finest service organization in the world. That was the vision. Right. And when I hired people in the beginning, they laughed at me and said, we don't even have a hotel yet. Well, we will have a hotel. But our purpose will be to strive to be the finest in the world. But then I have to also give them the motive. Mm. But my, my, when I established that vision, as a great leader, I have to agonizely ask myself, not just shortly ask and give an answer, no, agonize. Is this vision good for all concerned? Whom am I serving? The investors. Mm-hmm. Is this good? And the answer, after thinking about it and f- uh, contemplating, yes. Is it good for the customer? Yes. Is it good for the employee? And of course, agonize about it. Yes, if we're the best, we will have opportunity. That means they have opportunity. We will have more guests. That means we will be honored. That means they are honored. We will be respected. That means they are respected. It all comes together. You have to question yourself and agonize. And finally, is it good for society? If we are the best, we're good for society because we will be an example for the rest. Then once you finish with that, question yourself, would God approve? Mm. And if you do that, in that moment, you know how to go. You know the answers of what you do. You know the answers to questions that you have. Should I do this or not? Well, if it leads you to the vision, you should do it. If not, you Don't, should right. not do it. <laughs> it's simple. Should I accept that this employee is not doing the job right, having been advised, having helped? No, I cannot. I cannot compromise. I have no right to compromise. I have no more moral right to compromise. Once I know the vision is good for all concerned and God approves. It's clear. So how can you work without vision and without purpose with other words? Mm. But be very clear that you understand the motive of your own purpose to, your own, to yourself and the company. And be sure that it relates to the motives, to general motives of your employees. And let them know. Connect them to it. Now they're part. Now they're not only having a purpose, they're part of something. And even Aristotle said, people to be fulfilled need purpose and belonging. Absolutely. You um, you mentioned to uh, I read an interview that you had been in <clears throat> that you had uh, you trained 
uh, all the staffs of of all the what was it fifty Rich Carltons or whatever that you'd opened. Yeah. You'd, yeah. In the first at least three days, and on that third day, you would sit each employee down and ask them about their own purpose. That's right. And That's and right. I think the question was, where well, each department, six, each department. Yeah. Well, where do you want to yeah. be six months from yeah. now? Yeah, which 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 is a was a fascinating experience. The first time I did it. In fact, in fact, the first time I did it, it was in Australia. We opened a hotel in Sydney and sat down with them and I said, "So happened with the weather," and then it extended to every department. From there on, I did it in every opening and on every takeover, clearly with every department. I said, so now you, you're new here. What do you want your department to be six months from now? And, and the first one I did, I said, well, we want to be the best. Oh, that's great. What does it mean? Mm. And they defined it for me. In fact, they said things I would have been embarrassed to tell them. And then I talked to the dishwashers. I said, what do you want to be in six months? We want to be the best. Wow. <laughs> and then I said, what is it? And they said things I would have never told a bunch of dishwashers hmm. to be efficient, to be clean, and so on. Wow. There was something in your heart. That <clears throat> there was something. Oh, oh, when I when I, I built it up, but when I said, so now tell me what you want to be, they screamed loud. <laughs> I want to be want to be the best. So a few months later, one of them is not a very good. The question is, Whose fault is that? Mm. He had it in his heart. He wanted to be the best. We failed to keep it in his heart. We have to accept that as leaders. Mm -hmm. That is leading people. That's helping. As leaders, we're here to, to maintain that environment. Now, following, I did that in every hotel around the world. And guess what they said? In every, in every continent, we want to be the best. Every department, we want to be the best. It never changed. It is, it's amazing. It's fascinating. And, you, and we are, or maybe me, cynics. They, do they really want to work? Do they really want to be good? They do. I know it firsthand. And, and, and the, the role of leadership now is keep that emotion in them and, call for, in fact, build it and help them to keep that emotion and create excellence consequently. So why do you think so many, <coughs> many businesses – you know the Gallup employee engagement statistics, and sure. two-thirds of the American workforce is, is not engaged with their work, and I think worldwide that statistic is something like 87 percent of workers worldwide are not engaged with their work. Their heart's not in it. What is it that, that causes businesses to kill that, that desire for excellence or to do better at least than yeah. we're doing? Yeah, well, it, very simple. We hire employees to fulfill a function. Mm. That's what I touched on earlier. They're just commodities. They're just commodity. And as I said, the chairs on which we're sitting is fulfilling a function. We're hiring human beings. We're hiring human beings who want to be part of something. We know that for a fact. That has yeah. been studied all over. Right. Don't give, why don't we give them a chance to be part of you? Because we don't give them a chance to part, of it. they look for being part in something else. They looked of being part next door or with the union or whatever else. We missed as our leaders. The problem is we are managers rather than leaders. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. Instead of leading them towards something excellent, leading them, helping them to have a great work environment, etc., etc., everything. That is our role. Our role is to keep it in them. And, and otherwise we fail as leaders. We have to ask if this employee fails after a few months, we have to ask ourselves, our mistake, did we hire them wrong? Mm -hmm. Into the wrong job that they weren't fit for. They weren't fit for. Did we not orient them right? Didn't we align them right to the organization? Alignment is one of those passwords right. which everybody uses and nobody, it's not happening. Did we align them right? Did we teach them right? Did we handle them right? We have to question where we failed so we can improve our process of that creates good employees. Mm. Otherwise, if we, if we don't know what we did wrong in that situation, how can we improve? Oh, but it's so easy as manager. Let's just throw them out. And get somebody else. And go on and said he was not good. But just maybe you're the one who was not good. Well, just as maybe. you know better than anybody, <coughs> turnover is a very expensive proposition. And so huge. Every, every failed, you know, employee, that's a huge nick against the company. 
Uh, but, uh, financially. To financially, the, because nothing, you, you train them and their knowledge walks out the door. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Terrible. Terribly expensive. And you've got to go find somebody else <clears throat> and onboard exactly. them. Exactly. By the way, in, in our industry, during my Ritz Carlton time, now I'm gone a number of years already, the turnover in our industry was over 100%. The employee to over 100 percent a year, not in 10 years, a year. Wow. I was in Ritz, Ritz Carlton when I left was 18 percent. It's still high, but much less than the industry. And what is more, because we were respected as a caring organization, we always had people to come in and want to work with us. While the whole industry was crying that you can't have employees. What is the difference? Respect them, giving them purpose. All right. Horst, you, you took hospitality, because that's the industry you're in, but and, and service to a whole new level. You, you basically uh, turned it into a craft, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and it's interesting, You in your book you cite uh, Benedict, St. Benedict, and <laughs> yeah. his rule, yeah. and some <laughs> of the, the policies, I guess you'd say, that he laid down for his monks in the monastery whenever – People would come, different things they were supposed to do. Tell, t- tell me more about well, that. Well, well, just think about that. Yeah. Benedict, I mean, it's, it's just fascinating. Benedict, in the year 500, writes a letter to his monasteries how to treat guests mm. that come to seek shelter. And, and, and he said, I mean, and, and you have to read that and say, how close do I come to that? I'm, I cannot do it, but how close am I coming? So Benedict said, so if a guest arise, arrives, treat him as if it was Jesus himself. Wow. 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 Now what would I do if Jesus walks in the door here? <laughs> Imagine that. <clears throat> Next he said, and it's unbelievable, he said, the abbey, if the guest is by himself, for a, me- a need, needs company for a meal, the abbe, even if he is in a fast, should break the fast and have dinner with him. Mm. After he washed, the abbe washed the guest's feet. Oh my gosh. <laughs> how close do we come to that one? Yeah. So if you read that and say, wow, how close today can I come to that service? That certainly is respecting each guest that come in. Be glad at each guest in turn. Wel- truly welcome each guest. Truly welcome them. Look in them in their eyes and say, we're glad you're here. Serve them as well as you can. And that's how I look at service is simply anything can be defined. Let's define service for a moment. The first step of service is welcome. Not hey, but a real welcome. Honoring welcome. Welcome, sir. In that moment, if I say hi, I'm saying, oh, I'm in a new level. I'm here to say I'm here. If I say welcome, sir, good afternoon, or ma'am, or whatever. Right. In that moment, I say, I respect you. But at the same time, I'm saying, I'm professional. Mm. So welcome. The next step of service is to comply to the guest's wishes. The moment that the guest is in front of me, it's not about me anymore. Mm. It's about what the guest desires, wishes, or needs. And I have to be the one that helped them to make the right decision and do the right thing and give them the right thing. That has to my it's not about me or my company anymore. It's about their desire and need. That's the second step of service. And the third step step is thank you for allowing us to serve you. Have a nice day. Saying goodbye. That that repeats itself constantly every day. That can be in in a fast food store or in, in a or in a hotel or in a in a in a law practice. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter. It's the same. You, 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 you have a fine greeting from the moment when the contact from the, the, has to work out right, caring, respectfully, the instant make contact with the customer until the instant you leave you. And in between, you care for them, for what they need. So, Horst, describe for me, what, what's the satisfaction for you when you know that you have served this customer well and they're, they're saying, this is such a great experience, thank you. What's the, what's the satisfaction you feel at that moment? Well... No different than the football player that, that, that just run a touchdown. Hmm. I'm, I'm happy that we accomplished what we set out to accomplish. It's fulfilling. It's rewarding. It, it, it's, it, it's all, and then you always question yourself. You have to question yourself. And if you don't do that, we miss something. Would God approve? 
Mm-hmm. That's that's one of the 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 the, the great things. So ultimately, that, you're not just trying to please the customer; no. you're trying to please God. The, the, exactly. Well, exactly. And because if you do As that, if the customer with Jesus. Yeah, exactly. You know, and you, know that, you you have some biblical underpinnings for this. Yeah. You've got Hebrews thirteen two, for instance, where yeah. Hebrews thirteen one says, "Show love to the brethren." That means your brothers and sisters in the church. And then it says. Uh, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by this some have entertained angels without knowing it. That's right. And, and, and furthermore, your employees are very close neighbors. Yes. Love your neighbors Love yourself. your neighbor, right. Why wouldn't employees suddenly not be neighbors? Exactly. It's kind of really <laughs> silly, isn't it? You know? But so are the guests. Mm-hmm. So are the guests. So there you are. Your direction, your biblical direction is clear. It's very clear right there. But but again, I want to make clear so it's not misunderstood. That doesn't mean you compromise All right. f- away from your vision and one direction. Because when you compromise, that means you're going against the rest of your neighbors. I was going to ask. So your ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen, yeah. I'm sure periodically in your hotels you had – a guest who was not acting like a lady or a gentleman, <laughs> and what do you do with that? Yeah, point? we had that a few times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can bet on that. But it's interesting. Very beginning when I when I when I said in the first hotel, I was running the first hotel. I was in charge of operations, so I ran the first hotel. I said, "Here we are not employees. We are ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen." That means you behave, you act, you think everything like ladies and gentlemen, and so on. And you respect every guest as a lady or a gentleman. So, in fact, I remember so well a doorman who turned out to be an outstanding gentleman working for us for 30 years for the company. I said, well, Mr. Schultz, not every guest is a gentleman, ladies. And that's not our decision to make. Mm. That's not our decision to make. In fact, but of course, there comes a point when we make the decision, Dude. this is not enough of a gentleman, <laughs> <laughs> not enough of anything, and we have to do something about it very clearly. Delicately, and but clearly. Delicately and, and still professionally and excellently and, and with, with, with values and areas we have to do something about that. Have, we have to throw guests out of the hotel, sure. if you will, sure. But because you've got other guests that yeah. are... Sure. Sure, and and besides that, we have employees. employees. We have, for instance, I have a situation, and I, I think I tell the story in the book, where the guest was living on the club lounge, club level, and he he pinched the ladies that broke in the club lounge. Now, well, I I, I cannot accept that. I cannot. No. I, I have to protect my employees. Right. So we moved them out. You know. Um. You are serving a luxury market. But it becomes clear from uh, some of the again some of the interviews that you've done, you and your wife actually and your family actually live fairly simply, as I understand it. Yeah, well, we not uh, extravagantly. Uh, no, oh, no, not at all. And if, if, if this, this is not who we are. That's, we, we're not happy there. We're not happy in there. Uh, uh, we we have. Uh, we have a, a good life. Our the greatest value in our, our life is being together. Being together and and uh, enjoying the reading together, being together, and so on. You know, like most people, I uh, most people say, "Well, we like to travel together." I don't. I no. like to be at home together. <laughs> you get plenty you know, of travel. And plenty of travel. <laughs> so that in itself makes it very easy life. And we're not. We're, uh, if it's, uh, most people ask me because you know I'm, I'm and they, they think of me of a fuddy daddy, yeah. you know, Ritz Carlton, and all that right. stuff. And they, they ask me, what is the, what are the greatest restaurants in, in Atlanta? I said, I don't know. We, <laughs> we like to go. go we like we, <laughs> we like to eat at home, and we go to the neighborhood r- restaurant. We, uh, it's it's not important to us. But you know, bec- again, because of my travel everywhere, I arrive. I arrive in Hong Kong. I get picked up at the limousine. The owners of the whole hotel invite me to the finest restaurant, and, and uh, I, it's enough. Right. And and we find find truly fulfillment of just being together, to be together, to, 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 to go to church together, to be able to pray together, to live together and honor each other and, and, and have wonderful. a great, li- wonderful life together. A marriage is so great for me. It's such a great thing. If, if you think about that for a second, mm-hmm. the only institution on this earth that is ordained by God, mm. why wouldn't make, make that excellence? If I make an, how much work effort do we put in the efforts to make our companies excellent? Mm. Why wouldn't we put the same effort into our marriage? Mm. 
it all goes together. Excellence Absolutely. wins, Absolutely. and you're going to win in that too. Because no, if you if you're excellent with your wife, you'll be going to win. It comes back to you. You had a real turning point in your life that I want to come to, but before I get to that, I wanted to ask a question: How did you come to faith? Oh, I was I was I went to uh, was. Baptist as a, uh, as a uh, Lutheran mm -hmm. school, when a typical Lutheran got to three, year, three years of very intense at that time in Germany right. uh, 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 classes Catechism. before it got confirmed. And how? I mean, yeah. uh, unbelievable. It, uh, and, and today I think it was too much. You know, so and then it got confirmed, and then I left with my words out of the Bible for my life. Psalm 91, 4, he will take you under his wings and, 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 and add it in there, and your confidence will be under his pinions. His truth will be your shirm and armor, mm. your shield and armor. Mm. I, I was translating here. Yeah. So that was with me, but I didn't go to church. I didn't have a relationship, uh, but it was with me. And when I needed it, I, I pulled it out in a hurry. Right. But then something happened. I, in the meantime, I was married. My wife said, we have to find a church. I was very critical of every church. I'm, I'm critical. I'm critical. <laughs> critical. Yes, excellence counts. I walked out of it and, and I got. I took my job in Atlanta where we started Ritz Carlton. And my wife, staying back because she was pregnant, wanted to mm -hmm. finish her pregnancy, said, "Okay, find a church." I walked in from one church and then that, and finally found one. But then, still being by myself there, Sherry was pregnant. My mother called and said, "Better come right away. Your dad is very ill in the hospital." Mm -hmm. So I flew that night out to Germany, and all the way, the whole night I prayed for my father. Mm -hmm. Mind you, I met my father when I was seven. He came out of the war when right. I was seven years old. Right. I left when I was 14. Okay. I wanted more time with him. Sure. And I prayed so deeply to God, God, I, I need you here. And, and you will take me under your swing. And, and, I, and I bargained. And the I was best you knew to do at that point. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was there for ten days, and my father was fine. I flew back after two weeks, and I walked out of the plane in Atlanta. And on the way, I stopped people behind me, and I stopped. I said, "Goodness, I'm a hypocrite. I didn't pray once coming back and thank God mm. when I needed Him. Mm. I was." basically on my knees the whole flight and when I came back not once did I look him in the eyes and said thank you Lord you did it and I realized I'm a hypocrite and said that doesn't go I had this has to change I found a church but in the church I joined Bible class I joined I accepted Christ as my Lord and I must have from all I do and it was a relief it was a relief and I said because this this moment was so overwhelming to realize I'm a liar. I'm a hypocrite. I'm, I'm, what is this? What kind of what kind of person am I? I really question myself. It was a serious moment in my life. Sounds like it. Yeah. Well, then you had another serious moment when you went to visit your doctor at some point. Yeah. yeah and he yeah. gave you some bad news. Yeah. Well, yeah. I can tell you that. <laughs> I, well, I went to the doctor first and said it's no big deal. And when I said I have to check it one more time, and they took a sonogram and they said you have to be operated right away. And after the operation, I said, well, you had a serious cancer. Um, and on Monday, we're going to start. Next Monday, we're going to start chemo. We give it that, and this, and this will happen. This cancer always comes back as a, as a, as a uh, snowstorm. And I said, well, oh, 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 hold it. I'm in charge here. Mm. You don't tell me when we start chemo because I'm in charge. You can ask me. We can discuss it. But don't tell me that. And before, before, besides that, I don't accept your finding. So I went, who is the expert of this cancer? Well, the, the real expert is, in, is Dana Farber. So I made an appointment there and I had an appointment with the expert of this particular cancer. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a certain sarcoma. Mm -hmm. And met with them, and they said, well, it will come back within 10 months or a year, always as a snowstorm. I didn't accept that, so I went, I went to MD Anderson. <laughs> so they said, well, this is, you have a year to get ready. And didn't accept that. I went to Mayo Clinic. I'm sure they are smarter than all those guys, <laughs> but they told me 10 months. So you can imagine, when then I looked at my children, my, my one and a half year, five year old and 10 year old, this cannot happen. This God, God, that cannot happen. Mm. They all told me to do chemo, but they all said I would die. 
So I said, I look for alternative. And I found somebody that said, if you go on this diet. Now, mind you, I can tell you a long story how we found. There's no question about it. Unequivocally, God helped me to come to this sure. particular diet. I, I, it's too long a story. I accepted that diet. And I liked what he said. He said, you're going to live. The diet is going to go away. <laughs> so people said to me, oh, you were courageous not to have the regular doctors do that. No, the doctors all said they're going to die. They said, I said, I'm going to live, so I chose him. <laughs> right. and, I, and I went on my knees. We went on our knees, I can tell you. It's a good combination to let me tell have you. a plan but get on your knees. I mean, you better believe it. So, But the, the amazing thing at a time like that is suddenly – you, you really know. Oh, intellectually, everybody knows. But mm. you really don't know. They, they never really accept it totally. I am mortal. This is a short thing here. This is a short moment. And there's somebody else in charge, mm. no matter what. And I, and because all your ego, it's gone. Yeah. All the world, all the stuff, the, the pride, the ego, the career, the, all the stuff, and the hostels, oh, host, good job, and all that's all ir- oh. irrelevant, totally irrelevant. You got nowhere else to turn, and if God doesn't show up, that's only God. You're in trouble, right? You're in trouble. I, I do, do not understand how people can do without it. It's, it's, I it, it cannot fathom that. Mm. But God is there then, and you can feel it, and you know it. And, and you know it more and more. There is a relationship that is undeniable. And I know for a fact in my mind today that God was knocking on my door. He had knocked on my door many times. But this time he was knocking very loud and said, Hey, listen to me. Hmm. I'm here. Pay attention to me. I did. And you did. I did, yes. <laughs> and, and it never goes away. And, uh, it, 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 you, you, you seek this unbelievable relationship moments you don't ever have it quite there but you it never goes totally away and you know, the longer you're in it the no, longer you know my decision is the right decision rather than the other guy mm-hmm. my friend's decision mm-hmm. I know it's a terrible decision it's a si- decision to sentence yourself to oblivion mm. but a, what a sad thing and Absolutely. you want to help people like that oh Absolutely, to come to the end of your life and you're all alone in it. Yeah, yeah, that's it. You know, what, 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 a, what a sad decision. But you lived through it. You, yes. You did recover. Yeah, oh, yeah, we did. Recover. In fact, uh, the, the, the follow-up story, a couple of years ago, I had made a speech in John Hopkins University, happened to have dinner, and happened to have the chief oncologist sitting beside me. And I said, I had this cancer. He said, no, you didn't, because you wouldn't sit here. <laughs> when? I said, about 25 years ago. He said, no, you wouldn't be sitting here. I said, well, why would you say that? I went to all the experts and so on. I don't know why you would say that. He began, because he said, because nobody has survived that cancer. I said, I had it. And he said, since you're so sure, he said, I'm telling you, 25 years ago, that diagnosis wasn't as good as today. You didn't have that cancer. He said, but if, you, if you're so sure, uh, you, you were operating in a good hospital, I told him where, why don't they have, they, I'm sure they still have the slides, send it to me. So I did it. About, I was just checking in again into a plan, by the way, traveling all the time. Telephone rings, I answer the telephone, is, is the, this doctor, and he said, if you come to, back to Baltimore, I want to see you, because I didn't know anybody survived that cancer. Hmm. I had it. So, all you can do is go to God. And, God. And, and, and then, of course, you question yourself. Yeah. Wait a minute. First you said, why me, cancer? And now you say, why me surviving it? Yeah. And, and you, you try so badly to live up to the expectation. First you say, cancer, why me? Why not somebody else? Why and now I had to say, why me? Well, it may be. One reason is God knew you would tell your story. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. And glorify Him through it. Yeah. Oh, sure. That's uh, certainly try to uh, try to do that. Yeah. Abs- well, that's, you're, you're absolutely doing it. Yeah. You know. Thank you. You finally got your book written. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 That was a struggle. That was yes. A struggle. In, f- in fact, there was a kind of an interesting little side story. I, I met Stephen Covey, who became a real friend. Mm-hmm. What a fabulous man. I, one of the greatest singers of institutional excellence in the last century, him, Ipita Traka, those two guys, if you learn them both, 
You have the right thinking. Drucker and Covey. Drucker and Covey. And, and Stephen, uh, I went many times to there and, and uh, to present with him, sit on round tables, kept on urging me to write a book. And and if anybody knows knew Stephen Covey, when he talked to you, it was like needles going in you. Horst, he called me finally, Horst, I'm disappointed in you. Okay, oh, I mean, and, and I was driving. Oh, I was like, come, yes, yes. Anybody else could say it, I would brush it off. But he had his voice and the tone that went in you. And I said, yes, he said, you still haven't shared in a book what you do. You own it to, to, you own it to some society. You, own, you have to do that. Do you understand? In fact, I wrote the foreword. Oh, he kept yeah. on saying, wow. <laughs> I said, okay, I'll do it. But I forgot next day, just like all, every promise that we make, it was already, I get sucked into all kind of other things, busyness and so on. It's forgotten again. And then Stephen died. And I had such a bad conscience. Mm. And I thought, I have to write. Unfortunately, I couldn't get his foreword anymore. But I, I wrote a book. And I said, yeah, I got Ken, who is a good friend, that, too. That's, that's a good foreword as well. Yeah, yeah. And, and, uh, uh, and so I, I wrote it, and I said, Stephen, this is for you in many ways in my mind. You know, I'm going to write it. I'm going to do it. Well, I'm guessing that one of the reasons you wrote this book, in addition to telling your story and the passion that you obviously feel about excellence, is you are passionate to see others in their companies, their nonprofits, their churches, wherever they may be leaders, pursue excellence. It was absolutely driven by that, a driven to say, how can I say as simplistic as I can, not writing a college book, mm -hmm. but in a simplistic story, tell you very clearly, if you follow that, you cannot fail. I really believe if you follow that, it is impossible to fail. Now, you, that doesn't mean you don't have any setbacks, sure. that, that you have done it tomorrow. But if you take this, blueprint and passionately follow it and don't give up on it you cannot fail i was convinced about it well how and can you fail really if you're leading people toward a beautiful thing exactly right yeah, exactly that's part of it you you give value to people you give value to society you give value to everything and your organization will be dramatically successful as you look at the rising generations which today is millennials and very quickly is also going to be gen z yeah um any perspective or insight or wisdom or thoughts that come to mind as you as you see that generation beginning to find its place in the work world? Well, of course, everybody talks about the millennials because we face them right now, and the, the exes I don't know yet, but there have been studies made. Yeah. And, and the millennials, they say, basically there are two things what they're saying. They're saying, why, what is in it for me? What am I doing? What's in it for me if I work here? What's in it for me? Now, let's be honest. We want to say that too, but we, we were afraid to ask, you know. <laughs> we were afraid. They, they're not afraid. They say, oh, what's in it for me? I go next door. Right. We, we, it wasn't that easy for us we grew up. If us, it wasn't easy to go next door, and we wouldn't have dared to because uh, that, that job, was simple as that. Right. Keep it. That was, uh, that was the attitude. Jump, so up. they're saying, what's in it for me? Yeah. So, so my question is, why wouldn't you tell them? Well, I tell you what's in it for you. Here's our vision. You can join us in a dream. Mm. And that dream will accomplish growth for the company. That means it will accomplish growth for you. If we are the best in the world at what our vision was, if you try me to do that, then we will be respected. That means you're respected. We will be honored, in fact. You will be honored. So, in other words, you will be part of establishing the image of this company and simultaneously define yourself as a person of excellence. Tell them what's in it for you. For now, the other thing they want, and that becomes difficult, not at work now, in general in life, they're saying, do it my way. Now, we as hotel have to adjust, in, in the ultra luxury business, we adjust it. We, we call every, every reservation, say, what do you want when you come here? What can we do? Do you have an allergy? Do you have a diet? Do you want us to make some reservations somewhere? The arrangement in a museum? Whatever. We are, we are here for you. Check in time. We don't have a check in time. Come in whenever you want to. Check out time before dark. <laughs> Everything get 
to them the way they wanted. Because they, more and more, they will go in the hamburger place and say, I take number one, but I want two slices of pickles and only half a tomato. And, uh, that's how I want it. I want it my right. way. And by the way, that is luxury today. When we created Ritz Carlton, luxury was marble, chandeliers, and so on. To those customers, to the, to the sons and daughters of this customer, luck, that's not luxury. The luxury is to do it their way. So millennials will need to begin to subordinate what they want to what that customer wants, is what you're saying. No, the millennials said, no, we as business have to subordinate to their oh. <laughs> expectation. That'll be a challenge. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, Horace, thank you for being with us today on the Table Podcast. This, this is just a wealth of very valuable input on uh, leadership, on servanthood. Thank you for your experience and, and all that you've shared you. with us. And if you have a, a topic that you would like us to consider for the Table Podcast, please email us at the table at dts.edu and join us next time for the Table Podcast. I'm Bill Hendricks. Thanks for listening to The Table Podcast. For more podcasts like this one, visit dts.edu slash the table. Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth. Love well.